is. Welcome everyone to day two, um, plenary two of the Regenerate Conference. I am Summer Sidley Brown, one of your co-facilitators today, and I will be facilit co-facilitating with Sarah Winchell Fisher, um, who is going to begin the welcome and framing um, of this conversation. Um, and today I want to name that it is a conversation um, about community resilience in agriculture in uncertain times. Today we have three amazing speakers who are going to have a meaningful and organic conversation around their work, around their experience, around their learning, and hopefully we will have the opportunity to build community and get into deep conversation with them and each other. Um, Sarah? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to turn on my video. We'll see how this goes. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for our second plenary of Regenerate 2020. Uh, it is nice to see you all on what is you know, a, a, a weird and anxious day for many of us. Um, I uh, just sort of want to acknowledge that um, there's a lot happening in the world right now that um, makes this conversation particularly relevant today. Um, so we have three speakers. We have Zach Duchesneau, who is the director of the Intertribal Ag Council. Uh, we have a day, uh, your last name is Romero Briones. Did I say that right? Thank you. Uh, and we have Roberto Mesa. Uh, day is with um, the First Nation Development Institute. She works, uh, her work focuses around food sovereignty uh, with that organization. And Roberto Mesa is uh, both a farmer and is a founder of a food hub in East Denver. Um, and we're very excited to hear more about their work today. Um, so again, welcome everybody. Um, thank you, Zach, Ade, and Roberto for joining us. And um, Summer, I'm gonna hand it off to you. So first of all, I wanna acknowledge um, basically what Sarah just referenced, right? Working on uncertain times. If you could all just take a moment and if you need to take a breath because Truthfully, um, the entire world and in this day, specifically the United States is in a moment of uncertainty and that uncertainty um, I am sure for many is, is coupled by differences in emotion, differences in experience um, and differences in responses. And what I can say, my excitement um, is in being here in this in this conversation with you. Um, Sarah, as we were talking and planning, kept referencing the magic that happens across community. The magic, she, you know, it was like, I would reference it as fairy dust, the, the humanity that was found in your conference spaces that was so important um, to the conference planning team that we capture how do we make a virtual community? I encourage us today here online to be kind with each other, to be authentic. And this particular plenary is very human centered. That's what I said when I was, I had the fortunate opportunity of speaking with the panelists. So it's not tech heavy, it really is a conversation. Um, we invite you in to listen and learn from their experience and also to contribute. And I will start sharing my screen just to um, go over a small bit of logistics before we get into the conversation. Um, and here we are. All right, so some of the process for today is we will do check-ins. You've heard basic introductions, but speakers themselves will introduce you to the who they are and what they do. Um, then we'll have a speaker conversation. There'll be a short round of Q&A, and then we'll go into a longer breakout um, where you all will have the opportunity to talk amongst each other in your breakout rooms um, about the conversations 
that um, matter to you around community resilience and what you're learning and hearing and feeling in this moment based on the conversation the panelists had. Um, and then there'll be final words and checkout. So this, like I said, this panel is very human centered. Um, it's easy and want to remind everybody as we now transition ourselves into a virtual conference that there's also virtual etiquette that applies. So please type and enter your name so people can know who they're speaking to. We invite you to speak from your lived experience, listen to learn and give space. Um, I encourage that some of the ways space is given online is just in pauses. Keep your camera on, mute when not speaking, be present, have patience and empathy. And we encourage you to amplify value. This is about building community. This isn't about right or wrong. So with your comments, please be positive, please be kind, please allow them to contribute to the conversation in a meaningful way. And um, remember that everybody can see what you type in the chat, right? So be intentional with your words and allow for volunteers and facilitators to offer guidance and facilitation if needed. Some other things, if you're not familiar to Zoom, um, you would click these three buttons to rename yourself. Um, this is the mute button. This is the stop video button. This is the chat button. Um, if you need tech support, please call 505-393-1355. Again, if for tech support, it's 505-393-1355. I know that some of us may be calling in. Um, and then if you have questions or concerns regarding a session, please private message one of the hosts. There are volunteers in the conference that are identifiable through the tagline volunteer, and then it will have the person's name. And in this space, we want you to be mindful to care for yourself. Um, get water, stretch, you know, go to the restroom, turn your camera on or off, depending on what your personal needs are. This is about creating a safe space and a container for rich conversation that adds value to the regenerative the Regenerate Conference and add its value to your lives. Um, and so I'm gonna stop sharing screen now. And I think we will go in to just taking a moment for breath and then we'll invite our panelists in for the beginning of the introductions. Wherever you are in this moment, find yourself in your bodies, preparing yourself to be present, understanding that all that you are is enough and there is enough wisdom in the trillion cells that have been honed to this moment of perfection since the beginning of the beginning. Thank you so very much. And at this point, I would like um, to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. Roberto. Hey, thank you, Summer. And thank you, um, everybody here at Cavera to uh, invite us to share this wonderful moment of conversation, um, ideas, exchange, and um, solidarity. Um, my name is Roberto Mesa. Uh, I am a farmer in Bennett, Colorado on the Eastern Plains. And uh, I co-founded, and I'm also one of the farmers of the, of the uh, Emerald, Emerald Gardens Farm and um, co-founder and director of operations of the East Denver Food Hub. And through my work um, as a farmer, I've gotten a chance to experience firsthand some of the inconsistencies and the hurdles of small scale producers here in Colorado and our local food system. And it's really informed our approach to developing a model for farming and food system work that addresses those inconsistencies and really leans on the values of equity, inclusion, um, cooperative values and collaboration with our partners and our, um, and our community. And you know, with the 
pandemic, it really started to affect our, um, our initiatives and our objectives as farmers. And um, my work has strongly been influenced by my commitment to social and food justice and to also see those as values that can shape a viable farming operation. And so I've endeavored to kind of solve and meet these two issues of addressing food insecurity in my community and addressing the viability of our local farmers here in Colorado. Um, when the pandemic hit, we definitely took a hit as Emerald Gardens Farm. Uh, we grow microgreens in a sustainable greenhouse year round. And we were still building up our, our operations and selling to um, mostly grocery stores, farmers markets, uh, some food pantries that were purchasing local food and food service restaurants as well. And when the disruptions began to occur and we started to lose markets, we leaned on our cooperative and collaborative partnerships with a food co-op called High Plains um, that was delivering food to retail customers and needed a place to aggregate their products. And so we pulled in our resources. We looked at different models of distributing their products. And um, that's when we began to actually function as a food hub. We realized that the importance of aggregation and distribution was critical to this moment of need in our communities. And we endeavored to develop a, a model for food aggregation and distribution that met the needs that our communities were facing uh, regarding access to fresh local food. And so Emerald Gardens started to focus more on the resources that we have, leveraging those and creating a model that um, removes barriers of entry for young and beginning farmers and BIPOC farmers in our communities, while East Denver Food Hub started to work more on the aggregation and distribution model that um, has been very instrumental in working with nonprofits and food access organizations. And we've been able to create a, um, a kind of logistical um, uh, solution to connect farmers to those food access initiatives by way of doing the WIC boxes in support of the women, infants, and children um, initiatives that uh, an organization formerly known as Live Well Colorado, now Nourish, um, had been implementing. And that allowed us to rapid prototype this idea and these um, kind of uh, processes of aggregation and distribution where um, in a single day, particularly right now on Wednesdays, um, we move about 2,000 pounds of food in about four hours with a, a highly um, organized team and uh, we facilitate the aggregation distribution components of High Plains and then we work with um, some other products that we get from farmers to build into our, um, our deliveries to food pantries and food access organizations. And what we've noticed is that that not only helps Emerald Gardens um, buffer some of the economic hardships from COVID but also provided a model um, that allowed us to vision a food system that can actually um, support the needs of our communities and our local producers. And what for me has been very um, meaningful is looking at how this entire model is built on resiliency because as farmers, we have to be resilient, especially out here on the Eastern Plains. We encounter a lot of struggles with our weather and um, lack of infrastructure, but that also teaches us to be, um, to be innovative and to find opportunities in moments of challenging and, um, you know, and struggles that we encounter day in and day out. And so now we're approaching and innovating this model of food sovereignty that has synergistically um, come to fruition between the partnership of Emerald Gardens and East Denver Food Hub that occupy the same property on our 35 acre farm and looking for ways of, of not only meeting the immediate need, but also building a long term model that can support and sustain a food system based on the values that we're engendering as we do the work on the ground. 
Thank you so much, Roberto. Um, a day. What do you say, Hopa? Hien weka ni me asa white yachts. Kuti dime osuta koi mahada. So my name's Ade, and I welcome you into this space. I hope that your hearts are open to some of the words that um, the panelists have to share with you today. Again, as Summer said, it's a very emotional time um, for a lot of us. We're experiencing this time um, in very different ways. And so I hope that this panel gives people the space and the opportunity to um, not only wrestle with some of those things, but also to learn something new. Again, I'm Ade. I am um, Kochiti and Kiowa, born and raised in Kochiti. And some of you may know um, Ariel, who does work for Kibera, who is also my fellow Kochiti sister. And I also want to recognize some of the other folks in the audience who are part of some of my other communities. Um, Maybe Sally's out there, maybe Avery's out there. So just hello to you all. A little bit about First Nations. First Nations has been around since the 1980s. Um, we really were developed um, as the um, answer to some of the things that were happening in our country in the 1970s around civil unrest and, um, you know, racial and social changes that happened in the late 70s, particularly with the American Indian movement. You know, there was an overtaking of the BIA in um, the late 70s and 80s. And from that was birthed First Nations. We were the institution that was created by some of those folks who said, yes, we want self-determination. We want self-government in tribal communities, but we need folks who will focus on institution building and creating processes for which to we can retake self-governance and govern, governmental politics and relationships to the next level. And so First Nations was created. And one of the first actions that First Nations took in the early 80s, um, which actually got implemented closer to the 1990s, was to create a re-granting program where we support our primary purpose is to support financially indigenous communities across the country, Alaska and Hawaii. And not coincidentally, many of the first grants that First Nations gave were, were around food systems because in indigenous communities, food is intricately tied to our institutional makeup, whether it be environmental institutions, political institutions and social institutions. And so now I have the honor of running the native Agriculture and Food Systems Initiative, which we created as its own standing program um, about 10 years ago. And since then, we've given over 9 million grants to 362 different organizations across the country. And our job is to only fund tribal communities and tribally led nonprofits. And I say all of this because when we're talking about community resilience, I am honored and I am privileged to be able to work with some of the most community resilient people and places that, that this country knows. Indigenous people, as, as I'm sure Zach will um, also explain, um, have been through some, have been through pandemics. We have been through social unrest. And, and many would argue and I argue that some of those pandemics and social unrest have never ended. We are consistently in a time of um, exercising community resiliency in the face of um, threats and in the face of many changes that aren't always kind to indigenous communities. And on this particular day, um, thinking about Zach, you know, he's one of my mentors. I, I look up to him and he always asks very profound questions and prior to coming to this um, panel, one of the questions he asked, and I'm sorry, Zach, if I'm stealing your thunder, was that what, what would it look like if we didn't constantly have to be 
battling if we if we could actually explore what our community resilience was if we didn't have to think about having to like explain our community resilience what would that look like and when he asked that yesterday i got really emotional i had a very emotional reaction because one of the things that um, i hope to explore today is the fact that being resilient does take an emotional toll it does take a lot of work and it does take a lot of co cooperation and it does take a lot of exploration on how we treat one another and how we actually get through those rough times. And so before I turn it over to Zach, I'll just end my introduction with a short story. You know, growing up in Kochiti, um, one of the most valued characteristics of a person is not how much money you make or how fast you are at running or how great your corn grows, but a person's ability to empathize and to care for others. And so when you see somebody hurting, you empathize and you, you meet those needs. And so when I think about our panel today in community resiliency, I think back to those old stories that really tell, you, tell us what we should value in a community resilient place is that our ability to empathize and to care for one another. And I luckily get to do that um, in my job at First Nations. And um, I'll pass it over to you, Zach. Mute myself. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Zach Dushna. I'm the executive director of the Intertribal Agriculture Council. We were founded in 1987 to promote the Indian use of Indian natural resources for the betterment of our communities. And thanks to Ade and to, to the other folks for the kind and thoughtful introductions. And I'm going to try, try to abbreviate my remarks about myself so I can talk more about the, the work that we do. And Thanks to Ade for the perfect segue into the, con the conversation we had yesterday. Uh, what we were talking about is what did we want to leave people with? And, and it occurred to me that what I want to leave people with in this conversation is the fact that resilience is work and it's damn hard work. And what would we be able to do if we were able to leverage those efforts without a system to leverage them against? If we were working within a system that was thoughtful and had the right outcomes, uh, one of the quotes that I like to use, and I don't know who to attribute it to, or I would, so it's not a oversight of, uh, of omission, it's, an, it's uh, ignorance at best, but it's every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And that's what we're in right now in our ag and food system. This system was designed to, to promote anonymity between the producer and the consumer, as well as anonymity between investors and producers who are a very good investment opportunity. And I get to thinking about what would resilience look like without this system? And what it would look like is prosperity. And it would look like wealth generation and it would look like asset growth and it would probably look like innovation. Instead of having to remind folks, this is what we were doing 500 years ago before Columbus drifted across the ocean, stumbled onto the wrong damn continent, and then said, hey, this is our new place. We were doing all of these things already. So it leads us to another question that I like to ask people, if regenerative agriculture is such a damn good deal, why isn't it just happening? Well, again, regenerative agriculture takes some work and some effort. And if you're exerting all of your resilience against a system that's designed to keep you in commodity agriculture, you're not going to be able to leverage those talents, those skills, those abilities, those resources into the greater good as well as you could otherwise. We say at the Intertribal Agriculture Council that you need capital, you need education, and you need time in order to really get into regenerative agriculture. And the system that we exist within right now really confines us within a space where we don't ever have 
the conversation about regenerative ag or climate change mitigation strategies in the same discussion as what are you doing with your production income? Because it's a foregone conclusion that you're not going to have any of that left when you're done with your production year. That's all going towards your cost of production and then the debt service that you've got to make. So all of our solutions are really built on the foundation of improving financial outcomes for producers by being innovative in that space. And we had the good fortune of creating a CDFI with a pool of capital. So we didn't have to exercise resilience against, against a system. We were able to hit the ground running and innovate. And what we decided to do was come out with an equity investment for producers where they pay us a return on investment and keep that capital deployed in their community, turning over and creating assets in their community. And we've developed a great model that also serves as a very generous return opportunity for a prospective long-term investor that's looking for some liquidity premium. And our belief is that within every one of the over 3 million agriculture producers that's identified in the ag census in this country, there is an environmentalist and a regenerative agriculture practitioner that's confined within a system, exercising resilience against systems that have created the need for farm and ranch stress hotlines as a matter of federal policy. Created a reality where the ag economy is supported by 36% federal program payments. So those are the, the, the lenses that we examine this through and we try to find ways to help empower our producers and our communities and our food system purveyors in a way that they are able to leverage that production income for the improvement of their community, for the improvement of their own livelihood and the improvement of the ecosystem writ large. So that's the, that's the quick version of what we've got to say. I look forward to conversations and I hope the breakout conversations you have maybe get at some of those questions. And I'm, I'm a really good student. So if you've got some answers to them and wanna bring them out of those breakout sessions, please share them with me. Thank you. So this is what we're up to today. This was just the first 20 minutes, right? Um, I wanna make space for their introductions because so much was shared. And I also want to pose a quick question to the participants before we go into the conversation. Think about a time in this past year that you have seen, experienced, or felt resilient and Pop it in the chat, five to 10 words. We'll take two minutes because as you can tell, our conversation between Roberto, Ade, and Zach is going to be robust. I can tell you that it's going to be organic. And um, because we are working in new ways, some parts of this plenary will be iterative and adaptable, but it's all for us to arrive at some place together. So, I'm gonna give two minutes for participants, should you feel like, to pop in the chat, a place where you have seen, felt, or experienced resilience in this past year. Seeing farmers shifted in the face of COVID to feeding communities, giving birth, Really, real quality time with my dad and sister. That's the people, that's the empathy, that's, that is what a day Roberto and Zach have brought to the table. Helping our friends harvest their garden in the midst of poor air, working for a farm pantry. Hmm. Realizing I could depend on myself to be assertive during this crisis. The chat's blowing up. I want us to turn our time to our panelists, but there is lived experience, a wealth of knowledge, 
um, and a wealth of humanity just popping up in our chat box. Um, I said it yesterday, I said it earlier, the framing on how we move forward in uncertain times, um, especially today, where we are all sitting in the midst of uncertainty and calling on those 30 billion human cells that have been perfected to this moment. Like we have more answers than questions, I believe, and together we can arrive. Um, and so with that, I would like us to turn our attention to this conversation in which I will be very small. Um, how we constructed the conversation is giving the panelists an opportunity to engage with each other about ways they might deconstruct, demystify, or what curiosities they have about working in community, in resilience, in times of uncertainty. Um, and so I'm going to pose the first question and I'll pull that up with a slide and that will be probably the last slide you see until the breakout session process where I'm explaining that. Um, Ade, Zach, Roberto, my question to you all, if I could find my beautiful slide. Um, here it is. I'm going to share it now. Thank you for your patience. Share screen. And the question that, my first question to this panel that will kick off this conversation is, what is something you'd like to offer into this conversation with our participants to deconstruct or demystify the concept of community resilience. And I feel like that's a great feed from the conversation where we just had um, with the stories um, shared and the ways in which we have from budding entrepreneurs trying to decentralize the system and focus on producers to looking at ancestral ways of honoring what is strong and good and just um, and people being measured by their ability to have empathy to Zach saying, yeah, we should create a whole new system and we actually have taken steps to do so. And what would happen if, if that didn't exist? Um, so yes, again, the question that we're up to and what the invitation to be in conversation around is what would we like to deconstruct or demystify about the concept of community resilience? And I'm gonna popcorn it in my head and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start with a day if that's okay. And then you, you guys, I'm out. It's your conversation. Take us where you will. Yes, um, so thank you. I um, appreciate the first stab at this coming after Zach is always hard. So I get the first crack at this. When I, when I was thinking about this question, right? It was, it was really hard for me because there's so much that um, there's so many words like currently that we see all around us about community resilience. Like we have to be community resilient. And really, I, I was like, what exactly does that mean to, to someone? What is that exactly does that mean to me? And I think, you know, just generally to me, it's like the ability of a community to meet adversity or to meet the challenges ahead. And when I think about some of the communities that I work with in, in Indian country and in indigenous communities, like there's a, a long list of challenges um, that we're constantly facing and have been constantly facing from the time of contact. And to me that it has never let up. If it's not one federal policy or one economic hardship, it's another. And so the fact that Zach and some of the people I work with, me and my children are, are healthy and happy and and contributing members of our society says a lot about the community infrastructure and the things that we have in place in our community. We're creating very beautiful, strong people. But the but the hard part is is like behind all of all of those institutions is is a is a tiredness. Like having to constantly meet these challenges as as that as Zach when Zach posed the question, I think that's what made me so emotional is that when you're constantly having to fight, when you're constantly having to challenge 
when you're constantly having to put yourself in and say, this is, this is our perspective, this is what we've learned, it, it, it's very toll, it takes a toll. And so um, one of the things that I see being built currently into our institutions is this idea that we, um, you know, like, and it's not always valued in a capitalist system, that you take the time out to like care for your elders, that you take the time out to care for the, the more, the ones who are hurting in your community. And I think during the pandemic, we saw that. We saw uh, so many people in our community try to feed our elders, try to get food to the people who needed it because there were major food shortages in Indian country. But that toll, that emotional toll, like it's lasting. It doesn't just go away after the pandemic's over. Like you have like a residue that you have to deal with after the aftermath. And when you think about indigenous communities and so many um, pandemics and so many challenges that we have to face, there's a lot of residue there. There's a lot of things that we have to deal with. And the second thing is that I'm learning during the pandemic is, and want to demystify about community resilience is that our challenges are not new. Like we have seen this before. Historically, we have seen this type of situation before you know we don't we haven't seen COVID-19 but we saw smallpox we even saw chickens box you know there's like there's history does repeat itself and I think the more we understand our own histories the better and so one of the things we need to demystify is that history has relevance in the present and we need to have an accurate account of that history in order to really benefit from what it's telling us because currently we we don't always have an accurate account of our historical roots in this country. And that definitely needs to be challenged when we think about community resiliency because it's not giving us the fruits that it is meant to give us if we don't tell it correctly. I'll popcorn to Roberto. Thank you, Ade, for sharing that. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this question because you know, it, I think when I think about the experience that we've gone through as a farm, as a food hub and community food advocates here, um, you know, we didn't really, or at least I'll speak for myself, I didn't really have a chance to integrate this experience of going through a pandemic and what that means. And just recently, I've gotten the opportunity to actually reflect on that. And for me, I see the pandemic as a teacher because it has revealed to us the problem, but at the same time, the solution. And it's given us an opportunity and a moment of reset that you know, we're willing to try new things because so much of what we've tried already has failed us. And with that comes this need to develop kind of an, an emancipatory imagination of what the world could look like and what are the steps we need to take to manifest that world? I think with that also enables us to really lean on our values instead of just you know, using them as adjectives. Now we can actually use them as action uh, verbs that can really manifest some amazing things. And for me, um, the, our, our mission as a you know, social enterprise farm committed to social and food justice has now come to fruition in ways that I couldn't really articulate when I was trying to address what we're all about. And the pandemic has given us an opportunity to actually do the work that is now informing our perspectives for how to move forward toward a model of food sovereignty, community resilience in a local and regional food system. Um, it's, it's been very interesting to see how, you know, when my business partner and I and, and fellow farmer came out here on our own to develop a farm on 35 acres, we didn't know where to start. We hardly had any help. Um, it was a very lonesome kind of, um, you know, there was a lot of solitude in the ways that we were trying to build this up. And particularly out here on the Eastern Plains, it was hard to connect uh, with community members that shared the same values. And since we've been able to wholeheartedly embrace this moment of struggle 
to offer new models of uh, resilience and and um, and I guess offering new perspectives and solutions to the challenges that we're facing right now, uh, we found that there is a lot of people willing to join in that effort. And that kind of gave us a sense of uh, democratizing the, the struggle that we were involved in and understanding how we're all linked and affected by this, by this challenge that we're faced with today. So, you know, we, we think that there is a moment of possibility that has supercharged our ability to innovate new ways of working together to instill new values and to incorporate community in a way that you know we haven't really seen um, in previous moments or in different spaces. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, why why we're not a nonprofit, and my response always has to deal with the economic justice that we're trying to promote as a social enterprise, both as Emerald Gardens as a farm and East Denver Food Hub as an aggregator and distributor. Uh, we see our role as um, meeting the urgency of the moment that I think you know social enterprises are poised to really enact in their way of developing projects. We don't have a board to listen to. Our board is our community. They tell us what we need to do. They have full say in the direction of the business. And you know, by meeting those immediate needs, we've actually been able to remain viable in a moment of economic hardship. And you know, this conversation of um, decentralizing decision-making practices, building equity into business partnerships, and finding the support of uh, people with resources and, um, and funds to help us do this has been critical to actually implementing a model of food sovereignty that not only addresses the food production, aggregation, distribution, but also the economic situation that underlies a lot of the food insecurity that continues to, rep to, to replicate itself. Um, you know, we, we see now a very clear process of eradicating hunger because we don't want to see hunger being a source that um, promotes nonprofits to grow bigger and bigger and bigger to feed even more and more families. Like I would love to see food pantries develop metrics for the number of families that depend less and less on them because now we're addressing economic conditions that perpetuate hunger in the first place. And I think we can only do that as a community. What I see here in Colorado is now an effort and an awareness of the different uh, initiatives that are addressing these things from different perspectives, expertise, and disciplines, and creating a cross-cultural interdisciplinary conversation that offers multiple entryways and perspectives that can actually develop a a model for a resilient, equitable, and more compassionate regional and local food system. And I think that our, our role um, beyond farming and food distribution is almost as caretakers of ushering in this new way of living with each other and our relationship to food that grounds us in this moment of resiliency. And so, the more that I've come to think about things um, away from doing the on the ground operations, which has deeply informed my perspective and our conversations with a lot of different partners, is that you know it's it's the work that grounds what we're doing and that anchors us in moments of anxiety, but also helps us understand you know what are the intangible things that cannot be fully communicated but that are alive and present in the way that we interact with one another, which is the very basis of building relationships. And our community has a lot to do with that. And especially having a historical context, we notice these values again and again, being the core that enables us to overcome adversity through you know, our entire history of oppression here. And so those have become a now again, new ways that we can move forward in our path to 
develop this model of food sovereignty, economic justice, equity, regenerative agriculture, and seeing the intersections that uh, were previously kind of obscured because of the certain specific paradigms that we were working within. So ultimately for us, you know, demystifying community resilience has a lot to do with just having the imagination of, of visioning what is possible right now and leaning into communities that can actually bring those things to fruition. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody has wisdom. And we just need to reassure ourselves that there's a way of integrating all of that as we move forward into a post-COVID world. I'm going to pass it on to Zach. Thanks, Roberto and Anna Day, both very good and thoughtful comments. And I think where I would like to take the conversation maybe is back to that, what if we didn't need community resilience? I, I, we all operate under the misconception, I think, that capitalism is the enemy, and it's not. We were all capitalist here, we just didn't have the currency to do it with. And I think what we need to realize is that the government-sponsored greed is the enemy. And all of those that are extracting from the system between the producer and the consumer and keeping the investor from reaching out directly to the producer, that's the problem. Lenders in this country last year posted an, a net profit of 13.9%. That's at our expense. That's at the expense of our environment, at the expense of our ecosystems. And while a day and I are in nonprofits, that's a necessary evil because the only dollars available to stand up the services that our people need to, to alleviate some of the need for resilience is grants and charitable giving. And that ain't the damn answer. The 5% philanthropic charitable giving isn't the answer to this. What is the answer is capitalizing, and I use that word intentionally, on their inclination to generate money from their endowment through a capitalist system. So we've created this finance system where an investor can put money into our system. It will fund the work of our producers like Roberto and all those 80,000 Indian producers that we try to serve and we become part of that funding ecosystem. So our work is covered there as well. And we provide a four or five or 6% return to institutional investors that wanna change the nature of their fixed income portfolio and realize a little liquidity premium for tying their capital up in these systems. Our solution can actually generate the income for them to do their charitable giving from. So I think that's really the paradigm shift that we're looking to, to, to make in this space is we can be capitalists and do this. We don't have to be nonprofit and charities. I admire the work that First Nations is doing because I've only been the executive director of the IAC for a year and a half, seeking funding for the organization for a year and a half, and I'm already sick to death of it. And they literally go out and seek funding for their organization so that they can give money to others and try to find a living in that. And it's it's not sustainable for either one of us without someone else's money. And we've got to help illustrate the investment opportunity that lives out here in our producers. Right now, every producer in Indian country, for every $100,000 in capital that belongs to somebody else that they're using is making a $23,000 a year payment. So if you think about that from the perspective of an investor, there's a potential 23% return out there if you want to be an extractor. But what if you back off and you decide, you know, I only need a 6% return to be able to continue to do my philanthropic giving. I'm going to invest there and I'm going to invest for the long term because 6% is way better than the 30 year treasuries. So we offer that solution, but what our solution offers at a 10% return to our CDFI is a $13,000 a year savings for every $100,000 we put into that producer's business. You wanna talk about empowering regenerative agriculture? Leave some cash in that guy's pocket at the end of the year. Risk management strategies, paying for his health insurance, so then he's got the time to devote 
to attending to those practices, we can actually build a system where our rural folks and our urban folks come back together by changing this finance system and return to family farming where that's the income source. If we get outside of the parameters that conventional finance would have us be in, I was on a conversation with the Montana State, um, Michigan State Extension group the other day and one of them offered up, well, yeah, but Zach, in your model, you're only trading net worth for, for cash flow, trading net worth for profit. And I said, well, it's the same money. You're just coming from the presumption that the producer don't know what to do with it if it's still in his hands at the end of the year. And we think they do. That's why we're changing the system. And I told him we're never going to, it's going to be challenging to describe what we're doing with the terms of the system that want to keep us captive to it. That's all I got. Do I have to throw it to someone else now or are we running up yeah. against time? You get to throw it back to me and Sarah. All right. Yeah. Got it. So one of the things that I would like to know is do any of you have questions for each other now hearing, um, you know, like this first level conversation, if you could ask any of the panelists anything or be in thought um, with them around any topic, is there anything coming to mind? If, um, yeah, that's what I would like to know. And I'd also like to cue up Sarah um, because in our planning sessions, I thought she was amazing in what she was contributing. And um, I know this, I feel like this panel means a lot to Sarah. I don't wanna speak to her, but for her, but are, are there any things she wants to add or highlight? That always happens. When you call on somebody, you know their their internet goes down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Welcome to virtual conferencing. Um, a day where you're gonna comment or you just helping me out with space. So no, um, one of the things that I find as a person who lives in the Caribbean, I live on Saint, in St. Croix, US Virgin Islands, and we quote unquote, have to be a resilient community. We import 98% of our food. Um, the average age of um, our farmers is 67. Um, we have access to limited resources in terms of growing food. And in our first conversation, when we first met a day, um, and I want to just be very transparent because this is human-centered, her comments were so touching to me that I literally cried. We were talking about you know, some of the barriers to the concepts of what communities consider resilience is the outside food being pushed in. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to be like, you know, when there are pandemics, when there are times of uncertainty, even though we're always living in this moment, right? Like you acknowledge that quite clearly, this is just the climactic event, but our communities never actually left this disaster has been building right um because of lack of resources lack of investment um lack of health for our people because they're not eating the same like how do we get people to understand that pushing in your food from the outside that doesn't reflect us actually isn't helpful to building resilience you know like what are what are thoughts around how how we do that can it be done Yes, well, I just want to just like reiterate that conversation was really, again, it goes back to this idea that we have been through this, like we have been living through this. And I think what we see in times of pandemic and crisis is that our decisions have way much more weight than they do when there's not a crisis. But the situations haven't changed much, right? Like Indian country has always been really at the end of the supply chain line. That's why you have people who are driving 45 minutes to like hour and a half to get to grocery stores because the food supply chain doesn't even get to us. And so in times of pandemic, when the food supply chain is disrupted, that end of the supply chain is like in havoc, right? That's why we saw food shortages. And so in the time of crisis, we have to answer 
we have to answer for whatever's happening in our community, like Roberto said, and like our reactions in times of crisis are like an impetus for whether we're gonna change things or not. And so what we see is that in Indian country, we saw an overwhelming response by communities saying, you know what, we got to save seeds. Like we've been working on food sovereignty. We have a community garden. Like we need to make it bigger. We need to start having people have their own community gardens. We need to start thinking about the meat supply chain and getting our producers places where they can process their own food. But that outside response was much different. It was like, okay, we need to ship in the food. We need to call in the National Guard and we need to create boxes to drop off food to people who are hungry. And they're two very different reactions. And like the decisions we make in those times of choices in those times of crisis are gonna determine what kinds of changes we make in the aftermath of whatever crisis we're dealing with. And um, I think we're still in that time of choice. We're still having to make those decisions. And I think what I'm hearing Zach and Roberto say, you know, like they're offering solutions. They're saying, you know, we do have other choices. Like we don't always have to accept the food security box that has, you know, the flour and the lard. Like we're, we have to really think about the choices we're making in this time of pandemic. I could jump in a day. I'm so happy you brought that up because, you know, an interesting situation that I've encountered in my work um, is, you know, we're we're trying to present this new model and at the same time challenging kind of past models and past paradigms. And like you said, the outside response is let's ship in a bunch of food at the expense of local food that's available here. And a lot of the, the food that's coming in is you know, definitely in need of, of some mouths and some bellies. But I think what we're trying to do is understand that a reaction in a time of emergency is not to put a Band-Aid on it, but to really sew that wound up because we want it to heal right, completely so that we can rebuild something better. And one of the pushes that we're trying to do is both to educate our partners in the food access and in the hunger space to understand the root causes of hunger, and at the same time to hopefully partner with us to see what is the next evolution of their, of their establishment, of their organization. And I think that's where this amazing model of food sovereignty and partnership can come in because rather than accepting donating donated food or having you know, federal emergency monies come in a kind of extractive way, um, how do we capture that and redistribute that to our local economy and our local agriculture producers? As a food hub, I think that's where we have a chance to hack the system and to redirect the resources and actually innovate ways in which we can meet mutual needs in our communities. And we're, we're proving it week by week by just gaining the support of people that are slowly starting to understand what we're doing. And they're like, oh yeah, there, there's actually something to this. And by doing the work and proving the model, we're stretching that imagination of what is possible. Um, there's a, a statistic that in the first round of um, coronavirus food assistance boxes that the USDA implemented as part of their, um, their CFAT program, I think they were allocating $3 billion to purchases from farms that can be used to pack these boxes that were going to communities. And only 7% of those funds actually went to local producers. So there's a huge misunderstanding here. It's not a shortage of food. It's the means in which food travels through our communities. And as a food hub, we have a way of actually redirecting that and, and having a springboard to actually address that on an educational level, while at the same time, building partnerships and solidarity. And I'll just jump in real quick because there was a someone asking a clarifying question in the chat before we jump into the breakout groups. 
And what it was is, is, is basically the sentiment invest in producers as a solution. Yeah, that's the, the shortcut. But if you think about it in terms of an ecosystem, investing is like the long-term soil health practices that you're gonna that you're going to bring to bear to improve the outcome for everybody. The producers in this metaphor are the soil. Lending is the extractive monoculture that depletes the soil. And the grant making is the chemical or fertilizer that is necessary within the system to try to keep propping that up. And the solution is to take the money and directly invest it. Uh, redefine profit is a great point. Yep. Wow. Um, listen, I want to, ah, my camera. I was trying to save bandwidth. All right, that's it. I was trying to save bandwidth by turning my camera off and I couldn't get it back on, but I'm here now. And um, one of the things that I want to say is not only are you guys, in my opinion, extremely brilliant and articulate, you're also efficient. We finished this conversation two basic rounds with two minutes to spare. So that deserves an applause. Um, and what we want to do now before we go into the breakout session is to bring in some other voices. Um, whether you have a question you wanna place in the chat box or if you actually want to speak in by raising your hand and we will select you so we can hear your voice and you can feel free to ask all or any single one of the panelists a question. And we're gonna do this for about five to 10 minutes depending on the robustness of the conversation. And then we're gonna to prepare to go into breakout rooms. Um, so any questions? And if you don't know where the raised your, your hand button is, I assumed if you go to, hmm, that's a thumbs up, that's a clap. It's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, yeah, are, are you describing how to do that, Summer? I'm trying. At the, at, the, at the bottom of your screen, there is a place that says reactions. And if you click on that, uh, oh, it's not reactions, sorry. Let's see, it's three buttons that say more, no, it's not there either. Um, so if you click on the participants list, then you'll be able to raise your hand there at the bottom. Stephanie, can you, oh, great, I see it. At the bottom, if you click on participants. And if we, I'm gonna scroll through and see if anyone's hands is raised. And folks can also put questions uh, in the chat box. I see a hand, um, Kevin Jablonski, please yeah. come on mute, perfect. Um, okay, <clears throat> like here in the, all right, we raised grass-fed beef and unfortunately for this pandemic, it has increased our business, so we don't need it, but we have sold a couple animals through other uh, uh, outfits. Well. I mean, they basically take 30, 40% off the top just to sell to them rather than direct. I mean, that's a fair amount of money. And I mean, I realize they need some of the money for their marketing and what have you, but you know, that would be nice in my pocket. And this year it shows it too, because we kept it in our pocket. But anyways, a response to that? Yeah, I've got a response to that. I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. I've never been that bashful. You know, what we envision is we're at a, we're at a, a great point in our civilization and our society where we have technology. We can build a crowdfunded regenerative ag movement where that, that funder can actually be linked right to that regenerative ag producer they're funding and buy directly from you and take that middle person out. That investment takes care of all the marketing and the, and the distribution because you're sending product over. 
And I think one of the things to, that's important in our world, in the nonprofit world, about a third of our time is spent seeking funding. About a third of our time is spent reporting to the funders and reporting to the auditors. And another third is spent out there delivering practices. So we've got to shake loose of that model so that we can position ourselves out there alongside producers like you, Kevin, so that we can help you capitalize on different markets that don't have that increased markup on it. And I would just add that when I talk about indigenous food systems and like mainstream agriculture systems, one of the major differences is this idea. Um, I have a visual where you have a bar and really it's the capital, like the money system that creates this barrier between who is getting the food and the producers. Like when you think of an indigenous food system, if you had a hunter in the community or the family, you had access to food. If you had seeds or someone who could plant those seeds, you had access to food. But now we live in a system where the, where the only thing that determines whether you have food or not is this dollar. And so it really creates this, this disconnect and it inhibits a person and a society's ability to respond to inadequate institutions. And so when you when I hear you say, well, it's it would be really nice to have that in my pocket, to me, like that makes that makes so much sense, right? It it allows us to see what's happening in our society and that whole market if we have accurate like tallies about where the money is going. But right now we don't, right? We have so many capitalist systems that are that are halfway functioning that limit a society's ability to determine actually what's happening in an indigenous community if you had a food shortage and somebody didn't have food something was wrong in that society and you you adjust your society to meet that need but right now like with the only indicator being the dollar it's hard to do that and so i appreciate your comment I can also respond to that. Um, you know, as a food hub, we have to cover our costs. But what we do is we try and pay the, the farmer their price, what they set it at, so that we can find the, the creative ways and we take the burden of moving that food by way of educating people on the, the benefit of supporting an organization like ours, because essentially, the price that we try and then sell it to a purchaser or food pantry, for example, um, you know, I think that's one of the interesting things that's happening is because we're focusing on organizations that got funding, um, they don't really have to worry about, you know, that's their dollars. It's, it's basically grant money that we're capturing to promote job creation. And so they see that as an investment in their community because now we're providing the recipients who were previously there to get food donated now are empowered to generate some income in our food hub model. And so this kind of creates a, a, a kind of circular economy where the, the money that is used to purchase local food in innovative local procurement models can now offer job creating opportunities for our community. And these are kind of the imaginative economics that we need to play with, right? We're, we're doing different, different pilots with organizations and making proposals with nonprofits so that we can create resilient local food boxes and we can use those funds to, again, um, address the economic situation of our community members. And I think that's where we really get to this local place-based economy and practice of a food system that can self-generate itself and create some economic and financial sustainability. Granted, we have only been doing this since July, so we have yet to really evaluate the long-term implications of it, but what we're seeing is that we do get a glimpse of how this can actually work, and with every pilot, with every partnership, we get closer and closer to identifying the necessary ingredients to make this work as a long-term model. Thank you all so much for those wonderful responses to the question. Um, 
Summer, I'm sort of just jumping in here, but uh, I think this is the moment where we are ready to begin to shift gears and um, move folks into uh, breakout rooms to have conversations about the things that you've just heard. Um, so there are a few uh, just sort of logistical points before we do this. I know many of you are with us on Monday, uh, so you perhaps have had this experience of going into breakout rooms and having a conversation, but um, what's gonna, and, and Summer, feel free to jump in if you like to, if I'm missing something. Um, but what we're gonna do now is we're gonna send you all into breakout rooms of about seven to 10 folks. Um, many of your rooms will have a volunteer in the room and this person um, is there to take notes. If you find yourself in a room without a volunteer, we hope that one of you will uh, nominate yourself to be the note taker. Um, what we'd like you to do is not take uh, extensive notes, but listen and then we'll give you a prompt towards the end of the conversation to begin to put those notes into something called group map. Um, a link to this tool will be shared in the chat box. Uh, and it's a space where um, you can put the notes. So notes from your particular group, you'll only be able to see those and then they'll all get aggregated with all of the other groups. So uh, at the end of our session, you'll be able to see everybody's comments. And then we're gonna take that information after the session and do some work with it and send it back to all of you as the audience. Um, so uh, we have a couple of questions that we will give you to frame your conversation. Um, those also will go in the chat box and be present in the group map. Um, and our speakers, I believe, may be um, popping in and out of some of the discussion rooms. So, um, but I don't think that they will join you initially. And what I really hope you all, I can encourage you all to do um, if one of our speakers, I know that they are a wealth of knowledge and information, but if they jumped into a, a discussion group with you, um, try to stay focused on the question at hand and bring them into the conversation. Uh, even though I know it will be, there may be an inclination to ask them a bunch of questions about the information that they've just shared. Um, Summer, what did I miss? Sarah, you were amazing. You missed nothing. You were awesome at um, explaining the process design. I was trying to get the notes up behind you. So sorry if that was interrupting. Um, I will just post the questions up so we can give them the questions and then off to their breakout rooms. Thank you for such a beautiful and easy explanation. Um,